What's up you guys, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'm gonna show you the basics of the most important components of controls and automation hardware. In this video, we're gonna cover everything from main power coming into a panel, to power supplies and transformers, to terminal blocks. Then we'll look at the PLCs, including inputs and outputs, as well as relays and networking components. There's no way to cover all of the intricacies you could see in controls and automation hardware in one video, but this video should hopefully give you a basic understanding of most of the core components you'll find everywhere in controls and automation engineering. Okay, so this video is meant to serve as part two in a recent series I kicked off on the basics of controls and automation engineering. After that first video, I got some feedback from people that it would be a little more useful if the content was a little more practical. So rather than following along with a lot of content in PowerPoint format, why don't I actually show you guys some of this stuff in use? So without any further ado, let's dive right into looking at a lot of these core components. First thing you'll probably notice is that every component I have is mounted to this specific bent piece of metal that's called DIN rail. Okay, and DIN rail, D-I-N rail, is a specific standardized type of metal that is bent at a specific angle for controls and automation components to be able to easily clip on and unclip from it. Anytime you're searching for a component and you want to mount it in a controls cabinet, it's a good idea to look up a DIN rail mountable power supply, DIN rail mountable PLC. And ordinarily, all of the components you see here would be inside an industrial control panel, but I wanna showcase a lot of it to you so it's easier to just have it on a backer plane. Now, let's take a look at the power into this cabinet. I have it on this specific small piece of DIN rail just so that I could zip tie it for some cable management. But basically I take a 120 volt power into the cabinet. If you have larger components like motor starters that might require three phase power, like 480 volts, you'd need something a little heavier duty than what I have. But since I'm just dealing with 120 voltage or household outlet voltage, it's okay to just have it come in and land on our next components. Which brings us to the next component, which is the circuit breaker. circuit breaker, which can sometimes be replaced with a fuse, is meant to be your panel's local protection against overcurrent. There's a lot more than we can cover in this video on properly protecting all of your components from short circuits, but you should definitely be aware that basically every industrial control cabinet is either going to have circuit breakers or fuse terminal blocks for the main power coming into your enclosure. Next component you see here is the 24 volt DC power supply. This is a really critical component because in modern industrial controls and automation, you see less and less stuff getting powered off of AC voltage. Low voltage is inherently safer, so dealing with DC is safer than dealing with AC in almost every application. And since the industry is moving towards DC voltage applications, you need a power supply that can step down AC to DC. Next, hopefully you see these wires coming out of the power supply, and I have them landing on these blocks here, which are distributing the power to multiple zones. These are called terminal blocks. And I have a whole bunch of spares over here. And what you can kind of see is that there's ordinarily plain gray or white or black, like a plain color. And those are just meant to be somewhere that you can land wires on one side and a partner wire on the other side of the same terminal block. You can think of them like industrially rated wire nuts. It's a spot where two different wires or sometimes more than two wires meet up and it's best used for organization and keeping your cables manageable. It also can let you land inputs and outputs from a PLC on terminal strips in your panel, and then you have somewhere to land the wires that come from the actual devices in the field. So terminal blocks are super important. Green ones ordinarily correspond with a ground wire. Some variations on these, you can find some that you lift up and they have a fuse in them. These are known as fusible terminal blocks, which offer you an additional level of built-in overcurrent protection. You can also find two tier terminal blocks, which have two completely independent circuits that you can use. These are great for very dense panels. And a lot of the times you can find terminal blocks with three or four multi connections. These are really great for things like power disbursement or anywhere that you need one signal in a lot of places. Okay, the next thing we're gonna zero in on real quick here are relays. 
And in a time before PLCs, most of industrial controls was done using relays. They didn't always look exactly like this, but basically what a relay is, something that can take an input electrical signal and transform that to an output of either normally open or normally closed wiring. And that output signal can be completely electrically isolated from the input. So for example, the relays I have on here can be turned on and off using a 24 volt signal, but they can be used to control 120 volt outputs. Now, in modern times, it's very unusual to see more than basic logic being done with relays. And the reason for that is the PLC. Programmable logic controller is able to read statuses into the device and control the status of field devices. When it reads something into it, it's known as an input. When it controls something going out from it, it's known as an output. If you're familiar with Arduinos or hobby electronics, you're probably familiar with this terminology. So PLCs are able to be programmed typically using the five IEC 61131 programming languages. That numbering and acronym and abbreviation is a little bit unnecessary. Basically, the two most prevalent PLC programming languages are ladder logic and structured text. Ladder logic looks a lot like reading an electrical schematic, while structured text looks a lot like a conventional programming language. I've done entire past videos on these programming languages and we'll be covering them more in coming videos. So for the specific example I have here, I just have one input and one output hooked up to my PLC. And so for my input, I just have a simple push button and when I press it, my PLC receives 24 volts on that channel saying it's energized. And when I release it, my PLC receives zero volts saying it's de-energized. For my output, I have a conventional work light just to kind of show you that anything can be used as an output. If it's controllable in some way from electricity, it can be a PLC output. And for this specific application to show using a few different pieces of electronics, I have the output signal from my PLC coming into a relay. So the PLC is outputting 24 volts. And then on the other side of the relay, when this turns on, you can see a little green LED right here. And that's when 120 volts makes connection with the wire going to the light. So my input of a push button tells the PLC, hey, I see this input. I programmed it to turn on that output when it sees the push button. So I press the button. It turns on the output channel from the PLC because of code that I wrote, which activates this relay because now it's getting 24 volts, which connects this 120 volt signal to the light. This specific application, it's obviously unnecessary to use the relay and the PLC in this circuit because a simple push button turning on and off a light on its own is not a great use case for a PLC and industrial automation. But the purpose of this video is to show you the hardware, not necessarily build an advanced automation and controls project. The last component I think it's important to cover today because it comes up in almost every industrial controls and automation scenario is the switch. In this case, I have an eight port ethernet compatible switch, which would allow me to connect things like my PLC or smart hardware like a VFD or variable frequency drive or any other networked components back to a master controller or my main laptop, which could be reading statuses from them, storing data in SQL, displaying values on an HMI and things like that. Now, some of the most important components that we're not covering in this video are things like motor starters, VFDs or variable frequency drives and HMIs or human machine interfaces, which for the programmers out there can be thought of as the GUI or graphical user interface specifically for industrial controls and automation. But to speed recap what you've seen here, we've seen the main power supply come into a panel, which passes through a circuit breaker for overload protection, then goes into a 24 volt power supply, which then goes into terminal blocks for my power distribution. And then that powers my PLC it also powers things like my relay, my switch, and it can be spread out using terminal blocks. Everything is mounted on DIN rail. When you need to convert signals from one type of voltage to another, you need to look for relays. And when you need to network lots of components together over ethernet or other advanced protocols, you need something like a switch. Again, it's really hard to cover a lot of these advanced concepts without being able to show you them. So let me know in the comments below if this was a useful format or if you have other suggestions for how I can make this better. As I go through this controls and automation tutorial series with you, 
you, I want to constantly be making it better. So feel free to leave any feedback in the comments below. I'll link to some of the key hardware that I used here because everything I used here can actually be found on Amazon. Controls and automation does sort of have a little bit of a gatekeeping culture from the large manufacturers like Siemens and Allen Bradley. It can be very hard to find Rockwell hardware or Siemens hardware for a small time hobbyist. But thanks to companies like Arduino and Amazon, you're able to find almost every key component you would need to do home controls and automation for quite a bit more affordable than you ever could have before. Check out the links below this video if you'd like to find some of the hardware that I used in this video. I will say in terms of learning resources that can help you build some of these skills completely for free, Rockwell Allen Bradley makes a tool called Connected Components Workbench. Ekoff has their TwinCat programming studio. Arduino now has a PLC IDE or integrated development environment. And Ignition is one of the top SCADA HMI providers and you can get their core software for free to use on your home laptop or desktop. It's definitely not quite as maker friendly as like the Arduino hobby electronics industry or quite as collaborative as the Stack Overflow GitHub world of Python C Sharp programming. But my hope is that automation and controls can become more accessible and you guys can help be part of that. All right, so that is gonna do it for today's video. Don't forget to leave a like if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the channel for tons more great content. Let me know in the comments below what you'd like to see more of. Massive thank you as always to my Patreon supporters for making these bigger projects possible. As always, good luck with your projects. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.